the opportunity. And uh, we do have a question from Professor Flynn before you leave. Uh, and actually, you mentioned potential bias in the sample of firms selected to receive the questionnaire. And uh, the sectors that we survey and our survey strategy are actually laid out in the commission's submission to the OMB for review and approval. Uh, so we would appreciate uh, if you could elaborate on any source of selection bias that you see, in, uh, particularly in the post hearing, because this may be a technical matter, particularly the uh, selection bias. So uh, I'm going to flip that back to a to a question towards you. Could you explain what avenues you're using to survey firms that don't voluntarily answer the Federal Register questionnaire, the Federal Register notice? Or is the Federal Register notice the extent of the way that you are reaching firms to survey? Oh, okay. Uh, Jim? Yes. Go ahead. Do you want to answer that? Or I'll sit? If, if, we, if this is going to engage and require a post hearing discussion, but that I, might I, be I, useful. I'd be very happy to have, take that one on one and then Because we do want to get it right. I'm sorry. My mind. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Um, do any of the other panelists have a comment on that question or something like that? Okay, we'll turn to um, Commissioner Johansson. And this is going to be a little free, free flowing, but I'm hoping to get everybody a fair hearing. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And also, I would like to thank all of the witnesses for, uh, for appearing here today. I know that some of you came a long way, and I know we have impending snow, at least that's what they say. So things are a little complicated today. Uh, I thought I would start off with a very broad question, um, and that is, to what extent do Indian policies improve the competitive, competitiveness of Indian firms in, in India in, in third countries? Uh, for example, Mr. Pomper, you mentioned that the issue of technology transfer, is that really benefiting Indian firms? Uh, uh, are domestic, how are domestic content requirements impacting Indian firms? Are they actually helping them? If you all could speak on this, I, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Subramanian. Subramanian. <coughs> I mean, uh, let me try and answer this in, in a couple of ways. One is, I, I think the motivation for local content requirements in the last three or four years, it has basically come from this uh, uh, perception and need that Indian manufacturing needs to be revived. Indian manufacturing is doing very poorly. Uh, you know, uh, peak manufacturing to GDP reached 17%. Uh, compared to China's peak of about 40%, uh, and, and it's declined. So now <coughs> manufacturing GDP in India is now about 13.5%. So it's this fear of you know manufacturing decline, so much worse than China, that's actually driving uh, a big motivation for the LCR. So, so that's the, and the theory, and part of the experience for this, I think there's, there was one big experience of LCRs in India, which has happened with the auto industry. Uh, uh, initially, the uh, you know uh, this, the first collaboration between a, uh, the government sector and the Japanese firm Suzuki involved uh, uh, imposing local content requirements, and some people in India view that as a success because not only is the uh, automotive sector taken off, uh, but auto parts India is now a big hub and is now an exporter for global uh, automotive parts, a and some read this actually as a sign of success of LCRs. I'm not. I'm not endorsing that, but but that's kind of you know. Uh, so so the need to promote manufacturing, the success of China, uh, the fact that the auto experience was not so bad with local content is kind of driving this local content uh, policy. Yes, Mr. Schlesinger. Also, if, uh, are there concerns though in India that this is going to harm competitiveness of the industry, industry rather? You all can address that as well, please, Mr. Schlesinger. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just take up two areas so that we can just focus on a couple of discrete ways that um, Indian government policy is actually harming Indian, the Indian economy and Indian creators. One is in the area of technological protection measures. TPMs are enablers of business models, legitimate business models for distribution of content. Um, they're used, of course, here in the United States. 
uh, to enable myriad ways that you can access movies, music, games, apps, published materials today. Um, in India, similarly, legitimate business models would rely on the use of technological protection measures, TPMs, and effective enforcement against the unlawful circumvention or the unlawful trafficking in um, devices, software, technologies used to circumvent TPMs. Unfortunately, the Indian government in 2012 had an enormously uh, great opportunity to strengthen its legal regime, its legal framework for the protection of TPMs, and it essentially declined by creating sort of an upside down provision um, that as a default really allows people to circumvent as opposed to prohibiting the circumvention. And I think this hinders the ability of the Indian content industry, the creative industry, to use all of the forces um, within its power and using the legal framework to launch legitimate distribution models. Um, the second one and related one is internet. Um, in the internet area, in part because of the lack of protection of TPMs, there are literally hundreds of websites out there whose business models are built on providing access to infringing Indian movies, music, and other uh, kinds of content. Songspk.com, netload.in, which I know has an India uh, registrar uh, associated with it. And again, it's the lack of an effective deterrent policy against uh, unauthorized use of content in the internet context that is harming Indian filmmakers. I had a chance to sit down with several of the film studios um, and when I remarked to them that we <coughs> noted that Indian films were available on the internet in illegal formats within two days of their release in India, thereby you know, harming and potentially decimating the, the market in India for those films. They said, oh no, no, wait a second, the films are actually available within two to three hours of their release in the movie theater in India. Two concrete examples for you there. Yes, thank you, Mr. Plessinger. I imagine I have to get a whole lot of mileage out of this question. Uh, it's a very very broad one. So, so if you all, any witnesses feel like uh, respond to this further in, in post-hearing briefs, that would be great, or also possibly during my second round of questions. I did want to get one uh, question to Mr. Flynn, since I understand that, that he has to leave uh, somewhat early. Uh, Mr. Flynn, you stated that, that Indian policies will have little impact on the U.S. economy and on U.S. trade. Uh, that being said, there is quite a bit of interest in, in this hearing today. We have a number of witnesses from U.S. businesses who are apparently quite concerned about what is happening with India. I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on how, this might, how you think this will impact U.S. businesses and also if any of the other witnesses could possibly uh, speak up as well. Thank you. So my statements, um, uh, my only expertise in this area is in intellectual property, so I, I make no comment on that. All right, if you could concentrate on that, that would be great. And if so, other witnesses want to elaborate as well, that would be helpful. Thank you. So concentrating on, on the intellectual property issues, you know, take, take the two uh, most specific complaints that, that I believe are, are in the uh, complaints before you, which is uh, India's Section 3D of its Patent Act, which allows India to not grant patents on new uses or new forms of already existing substances unless those substances show enhanced efficacy. Um, or the other issue that I mentioned was the Nexavar compulsory license, for instance. And so the, the issue, just to you know, re-summarize my statement, was that in countries like India, extremely poor countries with very high income inequality, those kind of monopoly rights produce incentives that to profit maximize by serving the very highest sliver of income earners. Now that's not to say that reducing that monopoly does not have an economic effect, it does. You will have, you will make less money selling drugs at an affordable price in India even though you're selling more units of that drugs. The, the $5,000 a month price for Bayer was its profit maximizing price, even though it literally only, only sold hundreds of units. And that's because the difference between that $5,000 price and the price at which people could afford, you know, this, this charge, 
is so huge that you lose the profits in the decrease in price and you don't make it up in volume. So that creates a huge public policy problem, which, um, you know, things like essential drugs, we want maximum number of people to consume those medicines. It makes everyone in the country better off if the maximum number of people consume the drugs they need. But for the patent holder, that's not the profit maximizing behavior. So you'll make less uh, profits at the socially optimal policy. And you, so there will be some impact, but the impact will be negligible because you're selling so few units. Would any of the uh, other witnesses like to respond to this? Yes, uh, Mr. Shaw. Very briefly, I'll mention about the pharmaceutical sales. 88% uh, of the global sales of pharmaceutical comes from region where 18% of the population of the world lives, which leaves only 12% of the global sales of pharmaceutical, which comes from 82% of the population. And this constitutes whole of Africa, part of Latin America, India, China, Australia, New Zealand. Hence, impact on US sales or jobs is very minimal because total imports of finished formulations from US to India is minuscule and that's neither going to impact their R&D capability <coughs> nor employment in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. If you could respond as quickly, uh, my time's actually expired, but I would like to hear what you have to say. Just, thank you. just, just a, a quick point. I, I, just, I want to bring it back to the request letter from the, the committees and uh, as reflected in the Federal Register of Medicine doing this hearing. I, I think the letter specifically talks about not necessarily opining the ITC on the legality or the, the wisdom of Indian policies. The, the focus is on the impact on U.S. industries. In these policies. And I'd say from that context, um, I think there are good reason for U.S. companies and U.S. industries to be concerned about these policies, not only because of what's happening in India, but because of what I've heard referenced the contagion effect. Other countries like Brazil, Indonesia, Russia, South Africa are looking at uh, the policies that India incorporates on both localization measures and others. Uh, and the concern has been if there's not a, a significant um, uh, uh, concern raised in the U.S. government to these policies that other countries may feel free to emulate them and that this problem that many countries are facing in India will, will actually spread uh, to other regions. I'll also note just with respect to the pharmaceutical sector, I'm not here for pharmaceuticals, but I, I think there, there actually has been an instance where there was a product uh, exported from India to Vietnam, uh, thereby the sense is a, a product that, that is uh, uh, has been approved, uh, although under patent, still approved, uh, uh, subject to litigation in uh, in India, uh, was exported to Vietnam, thereby taking away actually export markets for that U.S. company just outside of India. So there really is a concern about contagion. All right. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Ms. Rog, Rog, well, my time has expired. You might want to expand upon this maybe during my second round of questions. And also, if any of the witnesses want to, to address this further, please feel free to do so in, in uh, post hearing submissions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rog. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the witnesses. And thanks for your statements, Mr. Uh, Superwoman. Can you pronounce your name once so I can? Because um, I always call you Arvind. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, you can either say Subramanian, as Indians would say, or Subramanian, as Americans would say. <laughs> okay, and I'll probably still make a mistake, but thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, just a couple of questions on, on this trade statistics. I, I haven't looked at these too closely. Um, you're talking about uh, bilateral trade grew 13% per year. Um, Guys, the 2012-2013 export statistics to India are down almost 11%. Is that right? Uh, that, that could well be right. Okay. 
um, which contrasts to China, which is up 10 percent, which seems like we've suddenly got a drop down in what's happening in our exports with, with India. And then I was looking at your good overhead uh, presentation there. Uh, this is the manufacturing tariffs slide number two. It's not labeled as a page. But, um, Talk, illustrates here that the applied tariffs coming dramatically down in India. Does this uh, uh, dark black line that's representing India, does that include the complicated reference prices and, and extra duties and surcharges that we've been hearing about? Um, no, this is this is the MFN tariff. Um, okay, yeah. so this would, is this like, uh, and this is a number that's, that's, where does this, the source of the World Bank. Okay. And on the first question, uh, Commissioner, this was uh, the drop in 2012-2013 uh, in is because you know India's growth dropped dramatically, and, and uh, you know and that's the reason why it's come down. And you can see from chart uh, uh, figure six, for example, that uh, uh, you know after the crisis again, India's uh, trade went down, but then picked back again as growth took up. So. It's strongly correlated with India's growth. Right. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, hang on one second. Um, you wanted us to make sure that we adopted a forward-looking perspective, especially for the likelihood of a new government in India. Right. Is there hope that a lot of these trends will change if there's a new government? You know, I, I, I don't want to make a forecast, and B, I don't want to reveal my preference uh, as to who I want. Uh, That's but, a trick question. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but I do think that, you know, if you follow the polls, for example, uh, uh, you know, the alignment of forces, I think there is a strong probability that the new government uh, will want to reverse what's been, frankly, been a slide in India's economy, both on the growth side and the macroeconomic side. A strong, uh, you know, instinct to turn that around, uh, based on getting the investment climate, both for domestic and foreign business, back again. Uh, I'm fairly confident that uh, the new government that's going to be the highest priority. Uh, so, uh, what, I mean, what I don't want this is to be slightly backward-looking and a kind of verdict on a policy regime that may not be valid going forward. Uh, and so, I, that's what I think I would urge you to bear that in mind because. We could have a very constructive uh, a start uh, once the, the new government is in place, uh, and I would urge you know us to do all that's possible to create the conditions for that positive constructive start. Okay, that that will be difficult for the new national trade commission because we have to look at the numbers we have. True, uh, uh, but, but but here's here's a, uh, and you know I think uh, the, the important point here is that uh, you know. By definition, you're getting a lot of sectoral uh, uh, voices. Uh, I, I don't think you lose sight of what's happening more broadly uh, on, on the macro side, and you know, both in terms of policies. For example, the, the FDI opening that's happened in the last one year is simply unprecedented. I mean, it's not as far as we'd like. There have been some clawbacks, but it's been uh, uh, his, historic, uh, almost, uh, the FDI regime. Uh, and to foreign capital. So I think just keeping a sense of, of the broader macro aggregates, and frankly also looking at, uh, you know, on the macro side, if you compare is the US-India relationship with the US-China relationship, which is an obvious comparator, uh, and if you look at, you know, uh, the, the, the trade surpluses and the current account surplus deficits that India is running, uh, it cannot be the case that India is a negative impact on the US economy. Uh, that's just a macro fact. India runs current account debt. So, you know, it's adding to the global economy. It's not uh, following better than neighbor policies. So the macro impact, at least by comparison, has to be enormously better than, say, China's. Okay. So um, when you talk about the forward-looking perspective, um, not not just looking at the uh, the sectoral, um, is that you're saying? I guess concerns are mostly sectoral. Um, so are there sectors that are more open that you would point to as the positive part of the story? Um, if you think about sectors rather than the overall map. Well, 
I would say, for example, uh, as Mr. Jerry Lau said, I mean, the, the IT sector, which is in, uh, in the, the engine of, uh, of growth, I think that's very open. Uh, the auto sector, for example, is now uh, a, a very competitive international sector. So I think that's, uh, I, I expect, for example, uh, going forward, uh, the, the, the financial sector, I mean, there's a, there's a uh, I expect, frankly, the financial sector that we're going to see a lot of opening going forward uh, as well, because we have a new central bank governor, we have who's uh, very o open-minded, we, we have an insurance bill that's, you know, uh, there's bipartisan support, it's just a matter of getting the thing through, and I think that will happen, with, and that will provide 49% ownership in the insurance sector. So I think uh, lots of positive uh, sectors as well looking uh, going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Popper, you seem to have a, a dramatically sort of different picture of what's going on in India. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what, maybe you're saying progress is stalled, that we have a plethora of problems. Uh, India is making small gestures, hat tipping, not doing doing very much substantive. Um, where do you see the most reason for hope? I mean, in terms of what forums, where we could be negotiating, where we've made progress in the past. If you had to pick out some, force you to pick out some good stories, what would you say? Sure. First, I, I would say I think uh, there, there may be some uh, selection bias in the coalition of companies that I represent. So uh, <laughs> that, that may impact my own not my own worldview. Uh, but I would say I think the what's really happening for the, the industry sectors that I represent. I should say, the AFI is, uh, you know, six, seven, or 18 coalitions, all of whom for years have been beating their head against the wall of problems in India. And uh, in 2011, you may know the, the Indian uh, government adopted its national manufacturing policy, which really seemed to put into place as a matter of government policy, these industrial uh, policies of forced localization on intellectual property and uh, high-tech equipment, these sorts of things. Uh, that I think also just again bringing it back to, to the request letter, even the, the Ways and Means and Consent Finance Committees, if I can uh, quote, says, you know, the government of India has enunciated a broader policy objective to develop and support Indian domestic industries by forcing foreign firms to use local facilities and suppliers and to transfer their intellectual property to Indian entities. I think this is fundamentally what is motivating all the, the groups that I'm working with. Uh, in, in advocating for uh, changes in Indian policies uh, and across a whole range, solar and high tech and uh, uh, movies and music and pharmaceuticals, uh, all of them are seeing similar policies and that's what's motivating us. Uh, in terms of positive stories, I do think that um, in a relatively short period, the US government has uh, really taken up the mantle. I think originally there was a little bit of reluctance to um, uh, push back on, on the Indians until I think they uh, the U.S. government started to appreciate that this really was a, a widely cross-sectoral concern and, and issue. So I think uh, with uh, administration officials from President Obama on down, President Obama, Vice President Biden, many cabinet secretaries, having raised it with their counterparts, I think that uh, was in, uh, a really a, a key component uh, towards uh, the Indians abandoning their uh, private sector component of the PIF policy, which I think was undoubtedly a step forward. Uh, and uh, we're, we're hopeful that continued engagement will uh, correct the, the industrial policy India that seems to uh, embark upon in sort of more positive ways. Sorry, just, just, I forgot the most important hopeful sector, which is the natural gas. I mean, that's where I think this huge uh, surge, there, there is going to be a huge surge in uh, US exports uh, to India. Uh, because India needs gas, we just signed, an, a company just signed an agreement uh, with the Texas firm, uh, and the possibilities are, are limitless. So I would say natural gas and energy is kind of the, uh, the sector of the future in terms of U.S.-India cooperation. So in terms of uh, reviving trade cooperation, natural gas would, would be one interest uh, that might point to in the direction of the, the possible FTA that you mentioned. Yeah. 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 Uh, what, I mean, what other economic forces is it? Uh, it would oil be an interest of, of the Indians in terms of of uh, being able to export as well as natural gas? Uh, no, I think uh, India is not quite an export. It's a huge net import. Right, from, from the U.S. From the U.S. You yeah. get a, a preferable position on oil exports. We start past FTAs. I'm, I'm just wondering, what are the big drivers of something? If, if, if in fact the world would improve and the U.S. and India would begin to negotiate more actively, 
what, what do you think the economic drivers and economic interests on both sides would be? Well, I think uh, uh, gas would be a, a big driver from the U.S. side, and from the Indian side, you know, the, the, the FTA would offer the, the certainty because under U.S. law, you're only obliged uh, uh, to give uh, export natural gas to countries through an FTA. So I think that certainty would be huge for India. I think the second big driver of an FTA would be the fact that uh, and this is something that hasn't come up is both countries are inflicting a lot of discrimination on each other by negotiating FTAs with everyone else. Uh, so I, th I think that, you, you know, the, the discrimination that's, you know, uh, compared to localization, localization is going to be peanuts if, you know, uh, for India, if, if TPP goes through, uh, and vice versa, if India and the EU negotiate something, uh, it's going to be very discriminatory on US firms. So I think that's going to be a, a, a big driver of cooperation. And I think, frankly, the other thing is, is several people have mentioned is, is the, the common strategic interest in Asia, which is going to be a big driver of cooperation. Great, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Keith, I've joined my colleagues in uh, thanking you all for coming. What a great uh, uh, effort that so many of you have made to travel and present information, and uh, uh, what a great mix of ideas. Uh, of course, we all recognize that these are two amazing countries, India and the U.S., and very complicated as well. And so to try to develop any sense of precision is, of course, hard. Um, uh, but but uh, that's the job, if you will. And so we'll do our best at it. Uh, I, I wonder um, if I could just start with Mr. Subramanian. Uh, uh, you, you, I think in your testimony you, you mentioned that there's a declining investment climate. Uh, can you um, say a little more about what you think are the main policies that, uh, that create that effect? And, and then the follow-up question will be, uh, just sort of I'll telegraph where I'm going, um, what do you think is the uh, what was the likely motivation behind those policies? In other words, is this declining um, effect uh, a surprise? Is it uh, an unintended consequence? Uh, how did, what are the policies and what were they motivated by? Yeah, um, so, um, I, I, uh, just to step back and, and, and uh, uh, you see, the, the two, I think, major problems uh, over the last three years were really uh, you know, complacency, and, and the sense that, you know, when India was growing at about 9% for seven years, there was a sense that India was going to be on, this growth was uh, preordained and India was an autopilot. So, so that was a period where uh, India's macroeconomic uh, problems started. A lot of capital came in, the fiscal deficit was unchecked, a lot of spending programs increased, inflation went down. So, so the macro economy became extremely vulnerable. Fiscal deficits of 10% almost, current account deficit last year reached 4.5%, and inflation is still at about 9, today it came down to 9, but about 10% for four years. That's why we had a near crisis last year. So I think going forward, uh, there's a sense that the macro economy has to be turned around, and steps are beginning. I think on the real economy side, uh, uh, there was a sense that you know, the Indian, we could ride the Indian IT boom going forward. And, and frankly, I, I think that was not sustainable. You know, we didn't do enough to, uh, to uh, build the infrastructure uh, to sustain manufacturing. You know, uh, infrastructure is probably one of the biggest constraints in India, and, and lots of people will tell you that. And that is true. You know, and, and part of it comes from the fact that, you know, uh, 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 lots of easy decisions uh, that could have been taken were not taken. You know, providing the conditions for foreign investors to come in, in power, on roads, you know, on ports. Uh, so a lot of corruption, a lot of bureaucratic slowdown. And I think those are the things that could potentially change going forward. So if you get the macro economy in order, which is happening, beginning to happen, uh, if you can get key investment decisions so that, you know, coal is released, power production increases, the ports are cleared, roads are built, uh, I think you know you, you get the momentum going forward, and then you have to do all the long-term things. But I think in the next one year, those are the things that need to be done. Let me, if I may, then ask a follow-up. What what are the if, if you think about um, small and medium-scale capital 
commercial coordination, you know, people getting together and doing deals. What what is the what, what would you suggest are the likely big drivers of that effect in India today? And what are the likely big impediments of that effect in India today? In other words, do you see capital formation and commercialization 